Jeffrey. Hi, Gazina. Did I ever tell you the story about my friend who got in trouble? She's a baker, German baker, got in trouble with the authorities. Did Why? I tell you about her? No. Well, they found stolen goods on her. Oh, my goodness, really? <laughs> oh, she stole an umlaut. <laughs> stolen, stolen goods. <laughs> It's not the season for stolen. Hi! Nice to see you Good again. Good to see you. Our last, our last it's show. It's a little bittersweet, isn't it? It is. Yeah. But it's been so wonderful yeah. to do this together. Yeah. It's been really great. Yeah. Episode so today, 12. Yes. you've got the lovely Pavlova. Anna Pavlova. Meringue, whipped cream, goodness. And you are doing what? We're making pretzels, real traditional German style pretzels. That's how I started my baking life. I was making 400 pretzels a day for a German woman in Northampton, Massachusetts. Yes. And I loved it. And, and then I branched out from there. But it's nice to always go back to pretzels. I brought a bunch that I had baked midweek. They were frozen, which is why uh, a lot of the salt has dissolved. Notice the front one. These pretzels are going to get dipped in lye, sodium hydroxide. This is the effect of the sodium hydroxide. It uh, encourages an advanced Maillard browning reaction. Yep. That's why they're dipped. They also have a flavor which cannot be duplicated in any way, shape, or form by any other substance. So this second pretzel I simmered in baking soda, mm -hmm. which is now very common. Um, all of the rest were dipped in lye, sodium hydroxide. Now, if you look at the pH scale, it goes from 0 to 14. Um, pure rainwater is 7 pH. And as you go lower, things become more acidic. And as you go higher, they come, become more alkali. Lye is almost at the very top of the alkali scale. So it's very, very important if you use it that you take appropriate precautions. This is now a 4% solution of sodium hydroxide in water. So I used 40 grams to a liter. Mm -hmm. So 4%, which is the maximum allowable in Germany, by the way. Yeah. And it does give you a very slightly, almost soapy flavor from all that alkali. Um, it looks innocent enough. It looks like a glass of water. So anybody who's dealing with lye, to, to me, that person is 100% responsible for making it, using it, cleaning up afterwards if it's not going to be used labeling it so you really take away any possibility of mistakes and wear gloves when you're dipping and wear gloves many people wear goggles yeah. i've never worn goggles and not i've ever. done tens of thousands if you get your finger into the lye you just go over and rinse your finger if you get some in your eye it will eat right down to your retina so you're blind Hence the goggles. Hence the goggles. Yeah. So to me, whenever I'm working with lye, it's as if it's the same thing as if I, I've got a chainsaw in my hand. If I'm using a chainsaw, the, the entire reality of life is, hey, dude, you've got a chainsaw in your hand. It's the same thing when I'm dipping. Mm -hmm. I'm not listening to tunes. I'm not having conversations. I'm focusing on what I'm doing here. So we shall dip and bake. Um, you'll notice that this table is covered with plastic. Thank you. That's because if you, the, the lye will discolor aluminum. You can see these whitish spots. That's residue of lye. If you get it on a wooden bench, it's going to disfigure the bench and that will not ever come out. Right. So. Well, also in German, people might say, then why not just do the baking soda? Well, flavor. The, the flavor is very particular. I find that the shine is very particular, too. But in Germany, pretzels are a part of a group of baked goods called Laugengebäck. Yeah, Laugen is lye, La right? And that means a lye baked good. Mm -hmm. It's in the name, so it is, it is official and it is required in Germany. But you, I can taste immediately if lye is not used. Oh, I am disappointed because I want that slightly mm -hmm. so it, mm -hmm. it doesn't taste soapy but it is a very particular taste yep. that I always look for in a in a great pretzel and that skin that it produces yeah is it's inimitable there's nothing like a pretzel the right? chew the little Christmas the flavor all matter but if you are frightened especially if you're doing this as a as something to do with kids because it's fun to shape them with kids then baking soda use of course. the baking soda sure yeah. sure sure I've heard two stories about the origin of pretzels. One was that in Germany hundreds of years ago, children who 
said their prayers well were given a pretzel, which is supposed to look like arms crossed in yeah. prayer or something. Mm -hmm. But recently I heard another one which I like more, and that is that some rich guy said to his chef or baker, I want you to come up with a product that lets the light in three times. Oh. Right, and I think there also might have been an association with Father, Son, and Holy yeah. Ghost. But that's, I like that story. Yeah, so, I like both of them. They work for me. Uh, interestingly, four or five years ago, I started making all the soap for our family. Mm -hmm. And it's lye-based. Yeah. So this is a 4% solution. The way you do it is you put cold water into a bowl, a stainless steel bowl, not aluminum, not copper, not iron, stainless steel bowl. And then you sprinkle the lye in and whisk it until yep. it's completely dissolved. Don't put lye in the bowl and then pour water in or it might splash. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. the proper technique. And when you do it in a 4% solution, there's not really any visible change. When I do it with soap, as mm -hmm. soon as I get the lye into the water, within 10 seconds, it's like 160, 170 degrees. Yeah. Yowza. You don't want to be inhaling. Over no, that no. no, no. No, you don't. Yeah, for, for that, for the soap, I'm wearing gloves up to here. And everyone has masks now, so put on, <laughs> put on <laughs> your sure mask. We sure do. Okay, so I'm going to get the pretzels, and we shall go to town. So first I'll get the solution into the bowl. Carefully. And I also make sure that I have the right utensils. If I, depending on the bowl, if I'm not just going to use my hand to dip them and get them out, I have them all ready. And make sure when you put the pretzel in that you kind of slide it in gently so that it doesn't splash back. That's right. A good precaution. Okay, and so my station is set up. I'll have pretzels here. They'll dip. They'll drain. They'll go to the sheet pan. That's, that's right. And have that draining station too so you don't have the um, w really wet and dripping pretzels on there. And I right. also... You can spray parchment, which is totally fine, but I usually bake on a silk pad yeah. because they, they do tend to stick. If you do use bake. parchment paper, um, in bakeries you can get different gradations. And if you use the thinner stuff, it's cheaper, but mm -hmm. the pretzels will stick to those yep. and you will never, ever get the paper off the back. Right. So yeah. I would say any, if you're using any kind of parchment paper, spritz pretty liberally. Yeah. Otherwise, it's so sad when they don't release. Yeah, the, the thicker paper, um, it is more expensive. It has more silicone in it as well, hence the non-stick properties of it. And oftentimes, not with using lye, but if you just do cookies and things like that, you can reuse that really high-end thick parchment a few times. And that offsets the cost, the higher cost of it, which is great. So you have other important facts. Refrigerate the pretzels. Yep. These were you mixed yesterday, divided yesterday, shaped yesterday, and refrigerated as soon as I shaped them. And they've gotten pretty puffy, uh, so they're definitely ready. And those of you who have seen any of these baking sessions, um, you'll know that most of the things I've done all 12 weeks have been in reverse chronology. Right. Right. So. But well, we have to prep. You prep from home. And they're ready to go when you mm -hmm. get here. <laughs> I love to. It is. It makes me so happy that your very first gig as a baker was with a German baker. Oh yeah. Well, her pastry chef was Parisian. Yeah. Her bread baker was from Grenoble, and they didn't want any of that German stuff. Uh. So she came to me after the first week and said. Do you remember Zat Hala, Zat you brought me the, from your grandmother's recipe? Now you will make Zahala on Fridays. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, Schwarzwalder Kirsche Torte. Yeah. The Frenchies didn't want that stuff. No. You're right. Okay, Lebkuchen. Okay, Dreistufen Sauerteigfurung, right? Boy, yeah. was I lucky. I That's took exciting. it all. And I'm breaking my own rules because I'm chatting. Oh, yeah. Pay attention, Jeffrey. I'm paying attention. Don't scratch your eye. Do me a... Yeah. Do me a favor and just lift this sheet pan off. The reason I made a batch of 10 was so that I could make these pretzels a nice size and not worry about them running into each other in the oven. And do not worry, Jeffrey will be showing you the shaping of the pretzels. Yep. We're just reverse chronology. And click on the link to the recipe if you want to follow along. 
Uh, the other question is, you have pretzel salt. I checked with King Arthur and they were out of pretzel salt. Uh. So um, I want to show you what I used that worked incredibly well. It was this sea salt, the coarse sea salt. Oh yeah, the, it doesn't the, melt. It doesn't melt and the grains were the right um, shape. Oh, so wonderful. it's not flake salt, I'll show it to you. It's not flake salt, they have those lovely oh, larger yeah, that looks granules. Great. Doesn't this look It spot looks on? like a fine substitute. Yeah, so that works and this is um, coarse sea salt. That worked really well. Okay, so these are all dipped. Now they will get salt on them. Another you, thing that I often put on, well, sometimes I score, sometimes I don't. When the scorings come out well, they're lovely to look at. When they don't come out well, they're not quite as lovely to look at. Sometimes they look like scars. <laughs> if, because they are tacky, sometimes they don't open up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If and you do score, I'll score one sheet pan and yeah, the other perfect. one I'll leave. That'd be nice. So now, salt. Salt only goes on the puffy top portion. The nice thing about pretzels for me, one of the nice things is that you get very distinct um, eating areas because the arms, if you've made it well, the arms are going to be skinny and crispy. Mm -hmm. And the puffy area gives you a very different thing. And of course, the puffy area is suitable for slicing and putting cheese or mustard or meat on. That almost looks like Swedish sugar, so don't confuse the two if you have them both. You can have a sweet pretzel. Sometimes I put sesame seeds on instead of salt. That's I'm nice. not a huge fan of the salt. I like the salt. Yeah, yeah. I'm a salty gal. Uh, okay. And I was telling you, my uncle, in, when we would go to Germany and Bavaria, my uncle Heinz, he would go in the mornings, get, wake up really early and go to the local bakery and get our, us brezen for um, breakfast. And some of them had cheese. Mm. Oh, that's my on top or in? I on think top? it was both. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was both. And it's not melt. Of course, it's, it's going to be a hard cheese. So it's incorporated. It isn't oozy, but the flavor was just right on the money. Mm. And now for scoring. And this is, are you using a straight or a curve? Does it matter? Doesn't really matter. Okay. If you are going to score, you will want to salt first and then score because if you score first and then salt you'll have salt in the crevices and that right. would be a mild defect I would think. All right now we'll bake them. These will be probably about 14 minutes. Great. Let's put a maybe 10 minute timer on. I'll do that. Also look at the clock. We'll put this in the middle. Yeah. Great. Minutes. And while they bake, I'll clean up this station and you're going to bring us over to the pavlova. We're going to do pavlova. Pavlova is a meringue based dessert. So gluten free if you need to be or even if you don't. And it's, it is uh, originating in New Zealand. Some Aussies might claim it as well. But it is named after a ballerina named Anna Pavlova who came to visit impressed them so much that they made her a beautiful dessert in honor of her and it should mimic a tutu. In the States, we're more inclined to spread out the meringue and make it flatter than this. When you go to Australia and New Zealand, it is more the original form in that it has that lovely shape of the tutu. So if you click on the link for the recipe, you will see it for a more traditional American style, uh, but the ingredients remain the same. And those are the following. Here I have my egg whites, and these are from my hens. They are incredibly fresh. How fresh? I reached under Miss Peggy, the hen, because she was laying, and all of our chickens like to lay in exactly the same little nook. So I had to reach under her to get the eggs I knew were there incredibly fresh. They won't be as billowy as older eggs, but they're more stable. So this is approximately three to four eggs. If you look at the recipe, it says three eggs. My chickens, no chicken will listen to you. 
when you say, I want exactly 33 to, you know, or 39 grams per egg. They will make large yolks, small yolks, small eggs, big eggs, so I weigh them. And my ratio is 132 grams of egg whites to one cup of sugar. And the kind of sugar I use is super fine sugar. And the reason is, is that as you add it, you want it to dissolve. Sugar doesn't really dissolve, it decomposes, but let's just say dissolve. And you don't want any granules of sugar left over by the time you start forming the meringue. If it is at all grainy, what will happen in the oven, that sugar will start bleeding. It will start caramelizing and you'll get these drips of sugar. So what I'm going to do before I start on the mixer, I'm gonna add my salt. And then over to the side, I have cream of tartar. Now that cream of tartar, some recipes you will see will add vinegar and acid. And what the acid does is it denatures the eggs. It stabilizes the egg foam which is fabulous because it's notoriously finicky, falls easily. You don't want to over whisk it usually. When you add a lot of sugar to it, it also stabilizes it. But again, make sure that the sugar you're using is super fine. If you cannot find super fine or Baker's special baker sugar, what I do, I have a tablespoon of cornstarch in here. All these elements that I'm adding stabilize the meringue. I add that cornstarch and I mix it up. If you just have regular granulated sugar, what you do is you'll put it in a food processor along with that cornstarch and blitz it until, can you see just how fine that is? Until it's more this consistency rather than those really obvious granules. So I'm gonna mix that up. Now I'm gonna start the loud mixer. Again, the salt is in there already. I'll start, I start on high, but eventually I will lower the speed before I add the cream of tartar, which is my acid that denatures the egg whites, makes them more stable, I want to make sure that I see foam, that this looks foamy. And one of the indicators is that usually a really nice egg white will have a yellow cast to it. It will start looking yellow. And you'll start seeing this matrix of bubble, bubbles on top. I'm going to slow it down. So there's a flashback, and maybe you can see these bubbles. That's foamy, right? I'm gonna add this so I don't end up wearing my cream of tartar. Cream of tartar, the acid, that is a result of wine making, which is pretty fabulous. Now I'm going to mix this until it gets to relatively soft peaks. Illegal maneuver, so home mixers, the utensils, the attachments that they give you are for, li are for liability's sake. They are never big enough that they hit the bottom and the sides of the bowl. Totally illegal maneuver. Lift it up so that you get every part. I can hear it. Make sure you continue holding on to this. Don't walk away, stay here. Now if you look at this, it looks a little different than when it was foamy. It's starting to get soft peaks. This is when you start adding that cornstarch sugar mixture, and I add it very slowly. If you add it too quickly, then it will weigh down the meringue. It won't distribute evenly. It won't dissolve properly. Oops, I want to get it in there. And I just tap it with something plastic, so just in case I get too crazy, I don't break the utensil. Some people put a tablespoon in at a time. I just like to do this steady little trickle. And so as you start whipping the egg whites, the reason you don't want to start adding the sugar until you get that foam is that the matrix, the molecular matrix, kind of opens up and creates these series of bubbles and then the sugar goes in there and protects the bubbles and makes sure that that meringue, that foam, becomes stable. What also happens is that the sugar is hygroscopic. And by hygroscopic, I mean that it leaches moisture from the things around it. So what it ends up doing is taking moisture from that egg white and taking it on as its own. If you add too little sugar, what will happen is that you'll get weeping in the meringue because there's this 
moisture that wasn't absorbed by the sugar that starts leaking out. So it's a pretty high percentage of sugar for egg whites, but it is just the right amount of sugar. So continue. And then that cornstarch is there to also act as a buffer to get any errant moisture out of the mix. So I'll continue, steady stream. And you can see how, if you see little chunks, that's usually just the cornstarch, and it will dissolve relatively quickly. And you continue doing this until all the sugar is added. Towards the end of my sugar addition, I'm going to turn the mixer to kind of medium, medium high speed. Because at this moment, when you go really high, you create larger matrix matrices of bubbles that can be a little um, unstable. They pop relatively easily. So if you start on high and you get a nice amount of foam in there, and then as you enter that stage where you're almost done putting in the sugar, I turn it down to about medium speed to get those bubbles finer, smaller, more stable. And you might, if you like a really good cappuccino, where you go to the place that's super fancy, Ray makes these, and you can have that glorious design on them, and the foam is almost like, it doesn't look like a foam, right? It looks like a little pillow. It's soft. You don't see obvious bubbles. That is called microfoam. And what that does is it creates a very stable foam that lasts until the very last sip, and it usually just anchors itself to the bottom of the cup and won't go anywhere for a very long time. That's how stable that foam is. So that's the same property of once I get this in, I'm almost done. Whoop. Now, this is my last little bit of sugar. I'm going to add the rest in. Tap, tap, tap. And now this, I, I do the same thing for foam cakes, is that I will make sure that it ends at medium speed to get this tight matrix of very stable, smaller bubbles. In that case, if you put the cake in the oven with these very large, very unstable bubbles, they could pop in the oven and your cake could collapse. You do not want that. So now you can already see how white, how shiny, uh, how stiff it's already become. Now let's take a look. Some people actually like to finish their meringue by hand, but I can see that it's looking pretty good. And I don't see any visible granules. That looks tasty. And when I do this, I'm, I don't feel any granules. It feels fantastic. So now it's time to shape. If you do the traditional American way, you would, oh, thank you. You would draw a circle about 10 inches on some parchment and then flip over the parchment so that you could see. So you could trace it, right? And then you flip it over so that you still see that ring without getting, say, like Sharpie or pencil on your actual meringue. But I'm going to do the official pavlova shape. But the first thing is I do is that I'm going to shape it on here. I'll first, though, put some meringue down here to stabilize this as I start shaping it. And then I have my spatula, and I will mound the meringue right in the middle. Raise it down just a little. And the difference also in this is the baking time. So if you did a more flat meringue, then you have less depth to the meringue, and it will bake much more quickly. So traditionally, that would be at a 200 degree oven for about an hour, and then you turn off the oven, and that you leave that meringue in the oven to cool as the oven cools down. In this case, what I like to do is I preheat my oven to 250. When it's ready to go in, I pop it in, and then I turn down my oven to 200, and I bake it for two hours. And then I either leave it in with the oven closed or slightly propped with a spoon overnight if I want it for the next day or for at least two hours or until it's cool. Look at that pile of meringue. Look how glossy and glorious that is. What I also do, and you don't have to do this, I just do it, is that before I start really shaping it, I take my spatula, 
I go around and I create a little divot in the middle to almost create a little receptacle for the cream. And I will be adding back to that as I start shaping. You'll see what I mean as I go along. And then I'll shape it a little with the spatula just to know what I'm doing with my upcoming tools. Now what I do is I am going to even this out a little so that we have an even top here. So I will just go around here with my spatula. Are the our lovely pretzels already out? Did I lie about my timing? Don't worry about your timing. It's wonderful to watch. So it's look like at that. Adults little being kids. Now the reason I take out a little more from the middle that I'm eventually going to have there is because as I start shaping it, I'm going to have some excess on my tool and I'll put it back in. And if you didn't make a divot at all, that's actually fine. What happens usually in the bake, it collapses a little and that gives you a natural vessel for filling. So there we go. Now my favorite tool to shape is this. Now this is a, um, a fondant tool. And it's not unlike a bowl scraper in that mm -hmm. it's flexible, but this mm -hmm. is even more flexible and it's got the 90 degree angle yeah. that I really mm -hmm. like. So what you do, they, ha they have two types, ones that are a little stiffer and ones that are softer. Here's a softer one. I prefer, this is really soft. Mm -hmm. So I prefer this, the slightly stiffer ones. They also have bigger ones, but I like this one. So I make sure that that edge is down and then I little cup it a little and then I go around the sides and you'll see excess comes off on the side. And this is what I will add back in there. So when I said you take a little more out because you're going to be adding more back in, or you can just put it in your mouth, I have no fear of raw eggs. And then I'll do another little lovely straightening out. So when you do pipe the top, let's make sure that, that it, everything is sitting beautifully. And it's not just a visual thing. It is also when you have a filling in there and you have some going around the edges, everybody gets the perfect amount of filling and meringue. The difference in texture with this and when you bake it more flat too is that you will have more marshmallowy center, which is what I mm -hmm. prefer. Now, the other thing you can do, I always like this too, that little swipe at the end. If you're finding it hard to do this perfect shape, that easily and you want to get this in relatively quickly, you don't want to take a lot of time, you can make it kind of look like this and then you can take your offset spatula, start at the bottom and just swipe up and keep going around. And that's another way of shaping it and keeping it within the tattoo theme, uh, the tattoo, <laughs> tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> Why does I tattoo? What is that thing that ballerinas wear? A tutu. Tutu. Not a tattoo. Though I'm sure modern ballerinas have, have tattoos. tattoos. <laughs> yes. So you see that creates this lovely little pattern. Do you have a preference for one style over the other? Um, if I can get the finish like this, like this yeah. I prefer this. Yeah. So this will be baking for about two hours. You'll know your oven. If I check it usually, if I'm using a new oven, and I put this in my, I don't put it in this oven. This oven Wait is a scorcher. Yeah. Also the smaller oven, if I preheat at the right time, it whisks away the humidity much better mm. than this does. That's the other thing on a very humid day, meringue can be a little volatile because of the excess moisture in the, in the air, that sugar will grab onto it and bead. But so what I do to transfer it over to my sheet pan, I put that little cardboard round down, and then voila, and then it goes into the oven. If it does, like after 10 minutes, you're noticing that it's get, taking on a little color, you need to turn down your oven a few degrees and just let it bake until you can actually touch it after an hour or so, how, see how it feels. And you can get a look at the inside when it starts collapsing to see if it looks too wet in the middle. You bake more, but I like this for two hours in my oven. From I start at 250, put it in, take it down to 200. Mm -hmm. So it gets that initial higher heat mm -hmm. bake, and then it gets the long ride at 200. Um, if, you're, if your oven does run really low, bump up that temperature, because if it is too low, it could start, the sugar could start weeping as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. so this but is by starting at 250, you probably encourage a little bit of a crust so that you, you do. get a better eating contrast. Exactly. And that high amount of sugar creates that lovely crisp, 
that crisp, crisp crispness because that it's sucking up that water, it's evaporating and creating that almost crystalline structure on the outside. Mm. Um, so those ratios are important and that's why I weigh my egg whites, that's why I weigh the sugar mm -hmm. so that that meringue is consistent every time. Because if you could get a dry meringue, the other problem with that is that you won't get a smooth finish. And by dry meringue, and this is called a French meringue or dry meringue anyway, if you over whip it, it dries out, it'll start getting chunky and you will never get a smooth shiny surface. If you are using it, say, for a mousse, where it has usually a lower sugar content than this, it's kind of hot, pretty hard to get this over whipped with that amount of sugar. But if you have a lower one and it dries out, you'll end up deflating too mm -hmm. much. That's right. So you have to make sure that it's at softer peaks so that you can really uh, keep that structure, that foam structure intact. Um, but with this much sugar, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to get dry. So now it's going into the oven. This is what it will look like after a few hours. Uh, and now on to you. Wow. So beautiful, Gazine. Thank you. I uh, love it, it. And it's a family favorite, meringues in general, a love big family it. favorite. Great. Okay, here is pretzel dough. It's just over an hour and a half old. Maybe it's two hours at this point. Now I'm going to divide. I'll pre-shape them, and they don't need to relax for too long before they get their final pretzel shaping. So I'll show you how this goes. The dough is pretty firm by nature, so you'll want to use a minimum of dusting flour so that it's not sliding all over the place. So. If this is going to yield 10, I might put it about like this, divide it in half lengthwise, and now I should have roughly five per strip. So we'll see how that goes. The yield is 100 grams each, the weight I should say. I usually go for something like 98 grams, figuring there's a little bit of dough on my fingers. My scaling is a little off today. <laughs> I don't like it when it's off. And Gazina mixed this dough for me, and she didn't have enough of the Bread flour, bread flour, so you used the blend, right? So what I did is I ended up, um, you, the, for the rest of it, I used unbleached AP, which is at 11.7, .7, and then I had high gluten flour as well. So I added it, and as I mixed, I got a bead for whether it needed more water because of the high gluten, and I added a touch more water because that high gluten was thirsty. But otherwise, unbleached bread flour is the way to go. Yeah, and also keep in mind that unless you want to have myriad packages of flour sitting around, which for many people they do because they're baking often, but if you're not baking that often, uh, it's okay to make a blend using some high gluten and some lower gluten to simulate what you're looking for. Yeah. And what do we have? We should have two more. I think I was getting about, it was going at 98 when I was doing yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, there's those. Now I'll round them, then we'll turn them into cylinders, and then we'll turn them into pretzels. Okay. I like to put them now with the seams up for two reasons. One, they'll relax more quickly because the seams will tend to spread. If we had them this way, the seams are more cohes cohesive and so it doesn't spread or relax as quickly. So for me, seams up for this product is preferred. And you'll notice I have no flour whatsoever on the bench. If I had flour here, 
It wouldn't matter how skilled you were. If you had flour down, the rolls would just slide everywhere and you'd really be really unhappy. All right, these will relax for really just a couple of minutes at most, after which I'll make them cylinders and then we will turn them into pretzels. And since one of the themes this week is, is lie, I thought, well, on that same theme, I'm going to bring some soap that I made to give to Ray and Gazina. So oh, here's a couple exciting. bars of soap for you guys. This one has calendula flowers that we grow and then yeah. dry it. They're beautiful. And this has um, French clay. <gasps> so enjoy some soap. Thank you, Jeffrey. They're you are beautiful. Welcome. Yep. I'll leave them here, okay? Now, tell me, why is lye used in the soap? What does it impart in the soap making process? Um, the process of making soap goes back to, I think, Babylonia. It's like 5,000 years old, mm -hmm. where somebody decided to pour wood ashes through, um, pour water through wood ashes mm -hmm. and create lye. I always wonder who figures out. Who did that, right? Yeah. And then um, the process of saponification means the water and the lye mm -hmm. are now meeting alien elements, meaning fats. This is goat's yeah. milk soap, by the way. Nice. Um, and after a lot of stirring, the fats saponify is the verb, mm -hmm. right? So when I was learning about soap making and was totally fascinated by the whole process and the mysterious origins of it, of somebody actually doing that, yeah. but somebody stirred nougat for 30 minutes also to yes. make nougat monthly mar. I but anyway, I was just sort of enthusing about soap making to my wife and she looked at me and she said, Saponify my fill in the blank. <laughs> well, I always said, like, if I were to go back in time, like, you know, uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, I'm like, I need to get a notebook of things, I, like recipes I need in the event this does happen. Since I was yeah. a kid, I was like, I need to get my kit together. And one of them was a recipe for, to make soap. Oh. It was, and I literally, hmm. I was a geek as a kid. I had a list hmm. of things that I needed to know. Hmm. Just in case, I went back in time. Well, the fun thing is, like, this is, I've settled on goat's milk. I've done it with plenty of other fats. So this has goat's milk, mm -hmm. olive oil, coconut oil. Yeah. Um, is that but, what makes the lye uncaustic, is the fat? I'm not a scientist, but I think that process of saponification neutralizes it. Neutralizes it. But after you make the soap, it's... Uh, it's in a block. So this one I make in a Pullman pan. Oh yeah, nice. Right? And this I make in a cardboard tube. Yeah. Right? But it has to cure for a month before you use it. Otherwise oh. it's very harsh on your skin. Well, that's right? probably the other thing But that the helps. fun thing is, you know, you get one good recipe and you can vary it with what you put in it. Oh, we have some it. lavender growing at home. I want to try lavender yes. soap. You can put different um, essential oils. This one has star anise oil. Nice. This one has, I think, lemongrass and blood orange oils. So there's endless it variations. It smells so good, so. Ray. I need, to, I need to hold on. I need to take a break for a second. Okay. You have to take a uh, bath? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll be. change your batteries. Hold on. Oh. So while we're waiting to change your batteries, I wanted to talk a little bit more about meringue. The type of meringue that I made was French meringue, mm -hmm. uh, and it is not heated. Mm -hmm. It has to go into the oven. Well, it doesn't. I put it in my mouth and I don't worry. But because it's not heated, it is therefore not um, safe to eat if you're pregnant, if you've got, if you're elderly. Or if you're buying industrial eggs, you probably wouldn't want to eat it. Correct. Um, and then there are two other kinds of meringue. There is Swiss meringue and there's Italian meringue. In those two cases, Swiss meringue, you are whisking the sugar and the egg whites over um, heat, so over simmering water. And in doing that, you dissolve the sugar, you get it up to the proper temperature. I always get it up to 170, 180 degrees. So For that Swiss meringue, you go that I high? do, and you know why? No, why? It is more stable. It's far because more stable. Because you're getting some moisture out, some of the Correct. water? Correct. You're getting some of the moisture out. Wow, that's so The other so thing you're doing is you're making it safe to eat, right? 170, 180 is the temperature for killing beasties. Mm -hmm. The other thing that it did, does, if you're going to change that meringue, the structure of it, by adding butter, i.e. Swiss buttercream, mm -hmm. you need 12 ounces of butter versus a pound of butter for it to come together. The flavor is superior, the texture is superior, because you have taken out that amount of Extra moisture, water, yeah. it is so stable that it comes together, so it will take on other flavors that you add to it 
much more happily. Yes. Oh, that's so interesting. It's lovely. And so that temperature does two things. It makes it safer. So right. if you're doing, especially if you're making wedding cakes, if you're one of those people that doesn't have an industrial bakery, but you're making that wedding cake and you're like, there might be people with immune compromised mm. systems. There might be children who are eating this and you're, you're worried. You get that meringue to cool. between 170, 180. You're good to go. Okay. I'm going to turn these into cylinders and then you'll have two minutes to talk about Italian meringue. Well, oh, yes. All right. I can talk about we meringue. We don't want to ignore Italian meringue, do we? Okay. If you let your rounds or your cylinders rest too long, the risk is that you'll get some air pockets into the finished bagel, which you definitely don't want. So I'm rolling these out roughly this long. Trying to keep them reasonably even. They'll get a nice taper when I do the final rollout, but for now this is good enough. Nice and tight. Finish with your thumbs. When you do roll them out to uh, form the pretzels, uh, approximately how how long? Do what you does make that them? look like? Five inches. So this is for. No, um, that's six, five and a half, six inches. And then the final. For a hundred gram. Oh right. the, well, we'll talk about that yeah, when I okay. actually do it. Um, also, by the way. Um, after I shape these, they're going to refrigerate at least for a couple of hours. Will you keep them and bake them? Uh, I, can leave yeah. you that, I can leave you that lye solution. I have lye. You do? Okay, good. I'm a Truman. I have lye. <laughs> okay, good. Then maybe you could get a couple of sheet pans so that I don't leave behind my silpats. Yep. I'm using a fair amount of vigor here. I think that helps to A, do it quickly, and B, keep them nice and uniform without air pockets in them. Okay, now I want to be sure I don't let these relax too much because I really don't want air pockets. So, Italian meringue. Italian meringue. So we went over French meringue, we went over Swiss meringue, and the third meringue is Italian meringue. Also heated, like the Swiss. Instead, though, this time, you create a sugar syrup and you get it to a nice hot temperature. And while you are whisking those egg whites, you slowly pour in that hot sugar syrup. Do you go to 238 Fahrenheit? It depends on what I'm making. If I'm making macaron, I usually do it closer to 235. Uh -huh. um, and what's also crucial for this is that you get a thermometer that is very accurate. Yeah. Um, and I found out the wrong way. I had this, these fancy digital thermometers and I bought a lot of them for class and I was walking around and the worst are the ones that you just clip on. Those are just mm -hmm. vary by 20 degrees. And I was noticing because I can look at how the meringue is behaving and I can look at the sugar syrup and know what the temperature by is. By the thickness of the by bubbles. By the thickness of the bubbles and how that meringue is behaving. And when you put it in, so depending on whose station where I, who station I was at, which is sorry preposition at the end of the word, terrible. Um, and I noticed that the thermometers were about 20 to 10, 10 to 20 degrees off, which will really mess things up. And since I realized that, I'm like, we're going to start over, and I'm just going to do visual checks on everyone, so we get to the right temperature. If you get that sugar too high. The texture, say, if for a macaron, will end up being chewy yeah. and terrible. If it is too low, then it, it just it, yeah. Yeah, it weeps and it won't have a structural integrity. It won't have that lovely shell. Mm -hmm. So getting a thermometer that's actually calibrated correctly will make your candy making, caramel, people who they're like always have trouble with caramel because it sets too heavily, it's like too thick and firm or too soft, it's not you, it's your thermometer. Like ovens, they're big fat liars. So I have the one that I like, which is the um, 
Thermapen. The InstaRead. The InstaRead yeah. Thermapen. Uh, and what I like about it too is that when you open it up, I have one right here, um, it doesn't clip on. You always have to hang on to it. But you, if, especially for macaron, if the sugar syrup is very shallow, mm. if you had a cl clip on one, it wouldn't, it, wouldn't it wouldn't even touch it. So this you will, would hold and it tells you the temperature right there. Um, and it is accurate to like 0 0.002, mm -hmm. per, like a crazy, mm -hmm. wonderful calibration. Um, and, and if you don't want to spend 100 bucks, you can do like the old timers do. Why does um, the thing say softball, medium ball, hard crack? Hard because crack. what they used to do was dip their hands into that sugar syrup, which is much hotter than boiling water, yes. pull out a little bulb and put it in cold water yes. to see if it's a soft ball or what right. it is. And the secret to that, I've done that before, and the secret is dip your hands in cold water, your three I've always fingers. used a spoon. Oh, you, oh, I never thought of I that. Just I just used a spoon. My hand oh my God, I'm not putting my fingers oh, now in Now you there. tell me. <laughs> well, I, I'm thought, a, I thought a spoon I'm was I'm an authentic easier. old timer, yes. okay? Though in there case weren't I'm, spoons back in the day, right? Well, in case I'm going on a crime spree, I will do it that way <laughs> to get rid of my fingerprints. Okay, now we're going to shape pretzels. I like to pull on it to see how much relative give there is. And of course, I can't really describe that to you, but... Trust me, so I'm going to now elongate these. It's going to be, they're slightly under rested, so I might have to go over it a couple times. But the things I want to point out are A, ultimately the pretzel is going to be wider than your shoulders, unless you're in the National Football League. Or a swimmer. Or a swimmer. Um, but you can see how long this is getting. B, you'll notice that there's a bulb of dough on the outside of each of my hands. That's very important because when you make the pretzel, which is done like this, you want to have that bulb slightly outside the body of the dough. Look how I'm holding it so that I can actually, whoops, get back there, so I can actually stretch this and make it longer. But look how much it wants to shrink. That's not a very nice pretzel. It was a little under relaxed, actually, but that's okay. We're you could see going. it shrinking back as, yeah. the, as you were. I'm going to give this guy a little more length because I want the arms to be skinnier. Yeah. But I'll show you a trick, too, because it is in the nature of the pretzel to shrink back. Once it's sitting on the tray for just a mere two, three minutes, it'll be relaxed enough where you can actually restretch it. Yeah. Okay, so. So the way I shaped that was the way I was taught, where you're, I'll show you in a little bit more of a slow-mo fashion, and then I'll show you another method, which is easy, uh, albeit somewhat slower. So get it to the full length, and I also want to rip one so that the leg breaks, so I can show you how to fix it. So get it to the length it should be, and then you want to do a double twist. So mm -hmm. that's clearly much more than a double twist. That's one twist. What I want to have is two. So I was trained to know when to drop it. So you pick it up just barely above the table, flip it, drop it, and then these two arms go to, up to the corresponding shoulder. The bowl goes outside the body of the dough. Pinch really, really hard with your thumbs to make that bulb adhere. Some people proof them like this. Mm. They're not my friends though. I don't think the pretzels look as good if they're proofed that way. And again, look how I transport it so that I'm encouraging it to stay nice and open. All right, let me show you another method which for many people is an easier way to start. Same start where you get it the right length, keep the bulb on the outside, and then you simply put it in front of you like an upside down letter U, cross once, cross twice, and finish the same way. I'll show you that method again. When I do the air twist, at the very end of rolling it out, I have to look away into the distance. Oh. I almost clear my head. Uh huh. Because if I think about it too much, I'll over twist, but if I kind of go blank, Oh. I can just do it without, literally without thinking. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so here's the second method again. One, two, three. 
all of these will get one further bit of stretching. You can jump rope with this, probably. Yeah, you can. So again, I'll do the first method. Okay, there's five of them. Should they go straight into the fridge? No, because I want to stretch them again. Okay. And uh, give us timing for the fridge. It should be in at least... It should be cold, 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 cold. So if you're going to bake them that day, expect to give them two hours at least, and so they're dead cold when you go to dip them. Um, when I started, it was I was doing production pretzels at 400 a day, and so we always did all the pretzels in the morning, and then the next day we were able to bake them off periodically. So they were refrigerated for 20 hours at least. Well, also, in bakeries, the refrigerators run very evenly and very cold. Yeah, and if you open it 50 times a day, you don't lose the kind of temperature Correct. that you lose in the yeah. home refrigerator. I have been known, if there's been a lot of activity, making pretzels, to shove it in the freezer for a minute yeah, or two before yeah, I dip. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. I don't leave it in there. I don't let them get fro frozen. But before I dip, to make sure that they're stiff enough and they don't lose their shape in the dip, I will put them in the freezer for a minute or two. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I should say is that by doing these by, doesn't matter how many, doing hundreds, it certainly feels like you're getting this really beautiful sensual massage on your hands. Yeah, it's it's nice. really very enlivening. So here's the second method again. One, two, three, four. I like the arms to go slightly upwards. I'm giving you a high 10. Now they're relaxing into really good shape. So they're not bubbly on the inside yet, but they're really easy to roll out. Also, by putting them in the refrigerator almost right away after you've stretched them, you are stopping that fermentation so they don't get too yeah. poofy. Yeah. Because you want that texture to be relatively firm. I like them chewy. Okay, so here's the first tray. They're all too squat. They need to be bigger, but now they're going to be very easy to bring to a full size. I'd rather do this now than when they're ready to dip, because when they're ready to dip, if I start stretching them, they might collapse a little bit or something, and I wouldn't want that. I've made pretzels with whole grain, with sourdough, I made them with spent beer grains once, which were dreadful. <laughs> uh, a friend Trump. of mine who's Swiss by birth, but she actually lives in Vermont, um, and she's a very important seed curator, which she calls herself. She gets seeds from around the world, a lot of Swiss seeds, um, a lot of seeds from USDA, and she saves them. She was telling me that there was a varietal of spelt, dinkle, mm. that was specifically mm -hmm. developed for pretzels. Really? Yeah, specifically for pretzels. So there's our pretzels. I'm going to cover them now. So you're going to bake these off tomorrow. I will. And you've got lye. I do have lye. Okay. Um, I don't know if we can fit both in this plastic bag. Do you have? Yeah, I've Maybe got. Maybe we can. I, I can do plastic wrap, and I've also got plastic No, bag. look, this will work. Oh, good. Now we still have to mix a dough, yeah? Yes. Uh, but while you get that together, I want to talk briefly about how I filled the pavlova. Um, the recipe is there along with, you can follow the link. Traditionally, it is like a chantilly, a creme chantilly, chantilly cream, which is a sweetened whipped cream. 
I like to add to stabilize and for texture and for taste, I add a, um, a very big spoonful of mascarpone. Um, and it helps stabilize it too, so if you happen to be traveling with it. So not long ago we went to friends, Ellen and Dan's, Margaret Nian's, uh, and I brought the shell with me and I pre-whipped the cream, but just to make sure that it stayed stable, I added this to it. So I would say a scant quarter cup. And it gives it a lovely, almost a bit of sourness like sour cream, which cuts through how sweet all of this is. And then you bring berries to taste. And in this case, I did it in, in this color formation because we've got 4th of July coming up and this is a great dessert to do for 4th of July. It is so refreshing, it's so summery, but also you, your palette is perfect. You just do blueberries, strawberries, I did raspberries and cherries, so you get the red, white, and blue. Um, and if you are doing a socially distanced cookout, um, or even if just in your small nuclear family, you have somebody who's gluten-free, this is perfect for that. On to you in the mix. Oh, righty. Oh, look at the baked ones, glorious. There's water. So water first always. In a home mixer, this kind of mixer, or even a Hobart, water first, very important. Here's some dry yeast. Now, I think the instructions on the screen say three minutes on first and mm -hmm. five minutes on second. Correct. With this kind of mixer, you may want to almost reverse that and go about five minutes on first, so you don't stress your mixer it, out with too much hot. time on second. Yeah. yeah. But suffice it to say, the dough should have a good level of development. But also, if you are not the best hand kneader, this is one of those doughs that isn't so tacky or wet that yeah. you could knead it at the end by hand. That's and it's, a good point. Um, and it's kind of a lovely thing to do. I just like to knead by hand. I put the butter in last. Soft butter? Yes, yeah, soft butter. It, when I started baking, um, we used lard. Yeah. The fat will give you a little bit of extensibility. Um, I'm not a fan of kind of industrial pork production in, in America. It, so well, it also tastes very chemically. Yeah, if you had, I mean, I would use organic lard, I suppose, but I'm, butter is fine with me. And you did not add the malt? The malt or did is you? in there. Yep, the, malt the malt is in, in there. there. And you can go without it if you can't find it. You right? can go without it. Hmm? Look at that. Look at that interior. This is perfect. Isn't and, this what you want? And listen to this over here. You hear oh, that snap? So perfect. Right? So this will be nice and dry and crispy. But this is my favorite part right there. Uh, not long ago, we were in Germany with the whole family. And one amongst us, mm. shall not name names, asked for mustard when the pretzels were out. Uh -huh. And the Germans just looked at him and went, what? Mm. What? Why do you need mustard? And they said, for the pretzel, of course. And they were like, of course, they, they, had, they, were, they did not know that Americans really? will dip. Yeah. Germans don't do that. Bavarians don't do that, no. Wow. I love it. I was mm. all for it. But. He was, we were all laughing because they were so confounded. And they only had the very traditional German mustard too. It wasn't the very yellow mm -hmm. French's. Mm. So it, it made for a nice comedy routine. How is it, Ray? Mm -hmm. It's delicious. Mm. One thing about, if you like pretzels and the act of shaping them, once you learn it, you'll have it. Mm -hmm. I went to um, bake in a bakery in Germany that was owned by, it was in Heidelberg, and a woman who had worked for me in a bakery that I owned in southern Vermont, she was German. She moved back to Germany and became part owner of this collective women's organic kind of nice. a little bit inflammatory um, in terms of sexual politics type bakery, but they made beautiful stuff. And one of the things they made, I baked them for a few days, was uh, pretzels. And at the time, I hadn't made pretzels in 15 years. I was in the room watching this woman make pretzels, and all of a sudden, she kind of gestured, did I want to yeah. come and help shape? 
but she was saying it in kind of a challenging way. Yeah. So I meekly said, sure. And I hadn't made pretzels in 15 years. I smoked her. Yes! <laughs> ha ha! <laughs> That's right. Mm. Yeah. That's a perfect mm. texture. So you're starting at what is the mix speed? And tell us, like, if we don't have time to go through a full mix, what should the developed dough look like? Can you show it in here, Ray? I'm eating pretzel. <laughs> oh, have a bath. <laughs> you can hear that the dough is dry just by the sound of the mixer. Certainly when you look in there, you can see that it's dry. What did I do with my scraper? There's a scraper over there in the, in the little box. Oh, okay. You will want to once scrape things well and feel the dough when it comes together. If it needs a few drops of water, give it a few drops of water, keeping in mind that flour has great variations in absorption one season to the next. So it should be firm like this. This might want a couple drops of water. It should be firm like this. And after I've given it, oh, I don't know, four or five minutes on first, then I'll just bump it up to second. But you can tell that even on first, the mixer is working fairly hard. Thank yeah. you, Christina. Now, if I need to add water, if I pour it here, it's just going to smear around the side of the bowl mm -hmm. and it's not going to come together. So by adding the water, I'm going to do it like this. I'll make a little hollow. And I'll add what I think is the right amount. But before you decide to add more water, make sure that it, it. Do, and it does come together because oftentimes you don't get the full right. notion of hydration right. until it comes together. That's right. Yeah, so don't do it too soon, in right. other words. You were going to say that, Ray? Where's my pretzel? Where is your pretzel? All right, in the interest of time, I'll put this now to second speed, and it'll probably want another three minutes. One other nice, interesting factoid about pretzels is it's the universal German symbol for a baker. And to this day, you'll see an iron or a wooden pretzel outside the door of bakeries in Germany to signify this is a bakery because for all those centuries when the majority of the population was illiterate, the pretzel would tell them what was inside. It's not unlike in France where outside a butcher's is a horse's head. <laughs> mm. Okay, since it's three, a little afterwards, I'm gonna say the following. This will want two more minutes of mixing the dough is going to be very smooth when it's mixed, and when you tug on it, it's going to have a lot of resistance. But for now, I'm going to turn it off, and almost with tears in my eyes, know, or maybe literally sad. with tears in my <laughs> eyes. Wow, this has been a great 12 weeks. I yeah, we can do this. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> this it's has the been first so long. Yes. house that I've touched Yay. in three months. <laughs> we've, we've been wanting to hug for so long. So thank you so oh. much. This has been such a great pleasure. And I hope you've had as much pleasure as we have. And happy baking. Really. Be safe. And hey, who knows? We might see you again sometime. We've talked about it. Yeah. So. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you so much. And keep on baking. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.